Hello everyone, I'm Prisa and today I will be presenting our paper, A Variational Database Management System. This work is intersectional. We take some concepts and methods from programming languages and apply them to databases. In particular, we recognize a repeated pattern in databases, which we call variation. We then abstract out this pattern and explicitly represent it in our database framework. But what is this pattern? This pattern appears when developers and database administrators have to juggle several similar yet distinct databases at the same time. We'll see examples of this in a few slides. I'll use the colors blue, red, and green to demonstrate when a group of databases illustrate this pattern. We also only focus on relational databases. For those of you who are not familiar with relational databases, I'll introduce them briefly. During this presentation, I'll also use a running example of a simple employee database that stores information about employees of some company. A relational database stores information in a structured manner, and it contains multiple tables or relations. Each relation has a relation name. In our running example, we have two relations called employee and depth. Then each relation has an attribute list. For example, employee has attributes empno, name, hire date, title, dep and depth now. And depth has attributes step name and depth now. And so far we have the structure or the schema of our database. You can also think of this schema as the type of your database. Finally, the data is stored in tuples or rows of our tables. Let's go back to the pattern of juggling multiple similar yet distinct databases. Multiple instances of this pattern have been thoroughly studied and there are tools that address them. Schema evolution and databases used in software development are examples of these kind of kinds of instances. On the other hand, some instances of this pattern only have manual workarounds which fall onto developers and database administrators to carry out, such as databases used in software analysis and tests. I'll briefly explain each of these instances. The first instance is when the schema of a database evolves over time. This problem is unavoidable and it usually happens because of changes of business requirements. Consider a running example. It could start with a simple database that only has one relation called employee. As time goes on and the company establishes more departments, we normalize the database and add another relation called depth and swap the depth name attribute in the, the employee relation for depth now. As the company grows and hires more employees, we normalize the employee relation by breaking the name attribute into two attributes. This behavior continues as time goes on. Note that we cannot just throw away the older schemas since some parts of the company may rely on them. So we want to be able to access this database under any of these schemas. Another real studied instance of the pattern is databases that are used in software development for multiple clients at the same time, a common practice in software engineering known as software product line. So here in our code development, we rely on a unified or global schema that contains every relation and attribute. However, when we want to deploy a software system for a client, we also have to deploy our database based based on their information needs. So there's a mismatch between the schema used in code development and in deployment, and we have to manually ensure that parts of the code for the blue client only refers to the blue schema and so on for the red and green. But not all instances of this pattern have been addressed by a specialized tool. For example, assume you have a consulting company that provides recommendations to its clients based on their data. To do so, you need to get all of your clients' databases and put them in one database. Although this is 
very similar to the problem of data integration, you cannot use a data integration system without having a mapping of your client's databases with the global schema. Even when you generate such a mapping, you still need to keep track of what tuple belongs to which client to give the correct recommendation to the right client, but data integration systems lose this information. So why do we care about having a database framework that explicitly accounts for variation? First is that new instances appear that we cannot use the tools that address very similar problems for them as I discussed it in the previous slide. The second reason is that these instances aren't isolated. In fact, they often interact with each other, in which case, again, we cannot use the tools that only address one of them. For example, our software development company could also provide consultation. So now we have an instance that has a behavior like this. Even worse is when the schema evolves and we get a more complicated behavior like this. So what we propose is a generic variation aware database framework that explicitly represents variation. But how do we capture this variation? First, we introduce a feature space of Boolean variables. For example, for the schema evolution, we can assign a feature like v1 to the first schema, v2 to the second one, and so on. Note that this feature space is closed. Then, we use propositional formulas of features to select a subset of our variation in space. Finally, we have configurations, which are mappings from uh, feature space to Boolean values. So what we want to do is to put all these databases in one database smartly. And since these databases share a good part, we take advantage of that and do not repeat the shared parts. So the pattern is the inclusion and exclusion of database elements in multiple databases with similarities and differences. These similarities appear in either the schema or the content of the database, so does the differences. The very important goal that we want to achieve is query all these databases at the same time and have a handle on the variation in our query as well as getting the result of our query from all these databases in one place without losing the information that which return tuple belongs to which database. Let's see a variational database in practice and let's go back to our running example. So we have the employee relation and remember that we had three versions of it. So we tag this relation with the feature expression v1 or v2 or v3 to indicate that it only exists if one of these features are enabled. Then we have all the attributes that could appear in this relation. Remember, this is the part that our databases are sharing. So now we, we also tag them with feature expressions to indicate what database they belong to. And then we have our data. But wait, we also need to know where each tuple is coming from. So we add an attribute called presence condition shown as press count and which is always present and that is captured by the true tag that it has and we add the feature expression of our tuples that indicate what tuple belongs to which database and we do this for all of our tables then we also have to state under what condition all of these tables exist this is captured by another feature expression that is applied to all tables and their elements. So here, for example, we're saying only one of these versions at a time can be enabled. Now, given a configuration, we can configure our variational database to the plain database variants that we had. So for V1, we get the blue, a database for v2 we get the red one and for v3 we get the green one okay 
Now that we have variation in our framework, we also need to inject variation in our query language. We take relational algebra and extend it. First, for our projection, we now project attributes that are tagged with feature expressions. Second, we add choices. I'll explain what a choice is with an arithmetic expression. Consider this expression. This expression has two choices and the feature expressions v1 or v2 and v2 determine which alternative of the choice either 1 or 2 or in the second one 3 or 4 should be chosen. So basically the expression on the left captures all four expressions on the right. Finally we add empty relation which you can think of it as a no-op and we add empty relations since an alternative of a choice can choose to do nothing. You can find examples of these queries in our paper. We statically type check our queries and our type system has this judgment form which you can read as the query queue has the type A tagged with E prime under variation context E and variational schema S. I won't go over the rules, but they make sure that there is no conflict between the variation encoded in our queries and the underlying schema. However, the variation in a query can be more specific than that of the schema. They also give the user the flexibility of not repeating the variation in the schema in their query. A property that is really important for a type system to have is variation preservation. What this property says is that given a variational query, if I get the type of this variation under the VRA typing system, I will get a variational type. This type looks something like this. Now, if I configure this type, and remember, we can configure anything that is variational to a plain non-variational. If I configure this type, I will get a plain type that will look something like this. Now if I go from the other way around, if I configure my variational query under the same configuration, I should get a plain query. Now if I, I get the type of this query under the relational algebra typing system, I should be getting the same plain type that I got when I took the first path. We formally define and prove this in COC. Uh, and this variation preserving property allows us to use the type safety of relational algebra and prove that VRA is also type safe. Okay, now I'll switch to our implementation. We implemented our variational database management system in Haskell and it sits on top of a traditional relational database management system. So the user writes their query in variational relational algebra and if it's type correct it will be passed to a module that explicitly annotates the query with the schema. This module basically decouples the query from the schema. Then the query is passed through some optimization rules and from there it is passed to the SQL generator module. Since our system sits on top of an or DBMS, at the end of the day, we need to pass SQL queries to the underlying database engine. These generators conduct three tasks, translating variational relational algebra to relational algebra, preserving variation, and finally unifying the schema of either the query or the returned table. Then the, the SQL queries are run and the results is scattered in a table, in a variational table and returned to the user. We can also configure the variational database for each of the variants and configurations that we have. As I said, our SQL gener generators have three main tasks and their difference is where they conduct this task. I won't get into their details, but from our experiments, we can conclude that NBFI is mostly be, it mostly performs better than NBF, and UBFI mostly performs better than UBF, while UAV mostly performs better than NBFI, and it is mainly comparable to UBFI. 
What I want you to take away from this talk is twofold. First is that statically representing an abstraction provides more expressive power. In our case, this allows us to discuss and prove properties regarding variation. So if I have a database that migrates over time and each time I'm adding tuples to it, I expect the older versions to be a subset of the newer ones. We can also prove more general properties such as variation preservation for our type system or semantics. The second point is that variation naturally raises in different domains and often is implicitly handled. Recently, there has been lots of efforts to explicitly and systematically handle variation, such as work on variational data structures, variational set solvers, variational parsers and interpreters, and so on. Thank you. I'd be happy to take your questions now.